Greetings, Joe Nerds. Today we're going to talk about this awesome place, Pumastone Passage. Bribey on the right, Sandstone Point on the left. This is Pumastone. Awesome stuff. A thousand and one uses, but mostly this. Yes, busy hands need Solvol because only Solvol gets hands really clean. So, get busy hands clean as a whistle with Solvol. So the passage was named Pumastone River by this dude, Matthew Flinders, back in 1799 in this awesome old-fashioned boat called the Norfolk. They're brave men. Look at the size of that damn thing. Now, where did this Pumastone come from? Well, geologically, it's a bit hard to say, but this is a little event called the uh, Hunga Tonga Hunga Aape Volcano. Big being not huge. And this is the type of lava that produces pumice. This is uh, andesitic or even rhyolitic lava. It looks like this in the, in the field, all full of holes and stuff it floats. So we'll look into all of that. And also the top end of this passage used to look like this. And it now looks a little bit different. Well, in fact, it then turned into this, the Bribey Islands. But now it's gone again. So anyway, let's have a look at it. If you dig the vibe, like and subscribe. And you know what I'm going to say. Let's, let's rock. rock. Well, folks, here we are coming out of Brisbane, across Virginia there, across Shawncliffe, across Woody Point, Redcliffe and Scarborough. And we're heading up to the southern end of Bribey Island, which is called Skirmish Point. And uh, there's uh, Sandstone Point there and then Bribey or Wongaree, I think it is, Bongaree or something, up through Pumice Stone Passage. There's the majestic Glasshouse Mountains in the background. Now, the geology of this is a bit easy. It's sand. It's all sand but what we're looking for is the pumice where did the pumice in pumice stone passage come from we're going to look into that there's a few problems here have a look at this google what is this a ufo it gets better though so this is the northern end this is after the breakthrough it's actually broken through again since this metadata but uh what are these these are mountains out in the ocean are they that's a bit weird because there's the northern tip of um morton island don't know where those mountains are Anyway, there it is. So before we have a look at where this pumice came from, let's have a look at what it is. Now, pumice is a volcanic glass. Here's some stereo for you. Come on, 3D it up. You'll have fun. Volcanic glass in that it's not a glass like you'd have in your windows. It's an amorphic structure. It has no crystalline structure in it. So it's basically very high silica full of gas bubbles and these go down to the microscopic level this is half a millimeter and it just keeps going if you drill into that there's more and more gas bubbles so this stuff is mainly air and it floats on water it's the only rock that does now if you want to make pumice you need lava but not this stuff this is too uh, too low in silica it's all runny the gas will escape from it so if you look at our lava chart here that we used last week basaltic and acidic and rhyolitic not impossible to get basaltic lava but it's uh, basaltic pumice but it's usually and acidic or rhyolitic you need very high silica contents and that produces this gloopy dangerous explosive lava uh, and this is also it here you can see it's extruding out so slowly. If that was basaltic lava, it'd run out of there like water. And it produces some of the most dangerous volcanoes on Earth. 
Um, this is a vent with andesitic lava coming out of it. Now, some of that was probably pumice. Can't tell from the image. This is in Guatemala City. And let me tell you, this is dangerous. This is so close to town, as you can see. And this is an andesitic volcano. These uh, vents start out either rhyolitic or andesitic as they melt through the crust. And eventually, the olivine magma from the uh, mantle can find its way through and they'll switch over to basalt. But generally speaking, they start out, and this is the dangerous bit, these things explode. Very nasty bit of gear. Well, folks, here's our old mate, the Hunga Tonga Hunga Aape volcano again, going off under the ocean, sort of, and it produced this, a pumice raft, a fairly big pumice raft, but not the biggest. We found this from satellite, about 10 years ago this is 30 kilometers long and it is huge and uh they don't know where it came from some sort of volcano but they don't know which one here's a raft this is what it looks like when you're on one of these rafts in a boat and uh it's pretty macabre obviously you don't have to worry about cleaning your hull but can it affect your boat well maybe not a sailing boat so much but it can definitely affect every other sort of boat. Now, we sent this amazing bit of gear, HMAS Adelaide to Tonga after that volcano with humanitarian supplies on board and a bunch of our brave men, skipper, brave, the, uh, all the mates, skipper, brave and true. Anyway, it broke because it sucked pumice into its cooling systems and they had to go to standby systems and standby systems are emergencies only. You can't set sail knowing your primary system is dead. So it was there for quite a while waiting to be repaired. So pumice doesn't have to form in the ocean. Just in our part of the world, it seems to. This is at Santorini. This is layers and layers of pumice and ash. And believe me, these are big. These are like 500 meters high. Also, this is a place called Hitkuni Bati on the Kamkacha Peninsula. And uh, I'll do it in stereo for you because this is pretty special. Let me tell you. Come on, let me know when you're done. Uh, I got it. Anyway, uh, there's 110 meters of pumice spread over an enormous area here. So it does occur on land, just not in this area of pumice stone passage that we're talking about today. Now, of course, the Aboriginal people have been here for, well, probably since Pumice Stone Passage existed. It's probably around 6,000 years old. It's come and gone with sea level rises. But the Cabi Cabi, uh, the Gundaburi and the uh, uh, Naganda people have been here all of that time. Uh, they treated the early convicts, castaway convicts, Pamplet and his mates, they treated them well showed them how to survive and in fact uh, handed them over to Oxley when he showed up some years later. So this is, uh, Aboriginal people have been here for a long time. Now, there's Aboriginal agriculture here. I know that's going to get me into trouble, but they were farming oysters and they had fish traps here and they've had them here for a really long time. Well, let's have a little look at these fish traps and these... Uh, Oyster farm beds, they said in here. They've mapped about 60 midden heaps. Here's one here. Cockle shells, oyster shells. Oh, not quite all in a row, unfortunately. These are the oyster farm beds. They run right along this bank, as far as you can see. Aboriginal people stack these stones here, knowing if they came back next year, there'd be oysters on them. That's uh, agriculture. And this is a fish trap. You can still see this. This is down at Sandstone Point. Been there for a very long time. This is a photo of it some years ago at low tide, and uh, yeah, it's been maintained over the generations. Folks, this is the catchment area of Pumice Stone Passage. So there's about 11 creeks that feed it, and anything that happens in this area is going to affect the ecology of that passage. This is the geology map of the area. Uh, the thing to look out for is Everything is basically uh, quaternary gravels and sands. 
except for the dark green, which is the Landsborough sandstone. And the red is basically the Glasshouse Mountains. Now, they're 22 million years old, 23 million years old. So the pumice is very soft. It doesn't hang around in the environment too long. So it didn't come from any of those. So these are the magnetics. Um, I don't usually show you this, but this is uh, there's some really serious stuff going on here. Uh, I don't think it relates to the surface geology, but as you can see with those red marks, there has been some really serious volcanism here, but I su suspect it was in the very distant past. So I suspect when our friend Matthew Flinders came boring past in his boat, the Norfolk, which was a sloop by the way, not John B, just a sloop. Brave people, that's a tiny boat to be doing that stuff in. He was there for two weeks, and I'd say he got there just after a raft of pumice had come ashore, and it was still sitting on the beaches, hence the name Pumice Stone River, and later on, Pumice Stone Passage. So pumice folks, here we are, what do we do with this stuff? Well, we can uh, grind it up, we can turn it into bars like this for people to uh, clean the dead skin off their feet. Blech. We can grind it up into a powder and use it in beautiful stuff like this, which they no longer make, to clean our hands with, sort of like this. We can use it as abrasive in a really awesome metal polish like this, mag wheels, bull bars, all that sort of stuff. And they do now make a pumice grit soap bar in Australia called Grit Mints. So there you go. It can also be used as a lightweight aggregate in concrete. These blocks use pumice as the aggregate. So yeah, it's pretty cool for that sort of stuff. Not a lot of heavy industrial uses as an abrasive because it's just not really that abrasive. It's silicon, whereas aluminium oxide and all the other carbides are much much harder so let's have a look at the rest of this passage because yeah it's not all about the pumice that isn't there so let's have a look at the northern end of this passage because there's some serious stuff going on there as well well folks here's the northern end of Bribey you'd be surprised that gun emplacement was not built in the water everything moves this is what the Caloundra bar used to look like you know about 10 years ago and because it's sand and sand is a fluid it can be a fluid it can be a solid and it can be an aerosol and it can change backwards and forwards here's a little experiment to see how sand moves up a beach and it moves fairly quickly uh, Sydney to here all those coasts in North New South Wales it's all coming here so this is what the Calandra bar looked like well till a week or so ago and that platform there was a gun platform on the beach not anymore and here it is a few years earlier and you can see the gun platforms not too far off the beach but it ain't on the beach anymore so now it all looks like this we've broken through in two more places so we now have Bribe Islands maybe we will see but anyway let's have a look at some more sand problems around the place now this is in northern new south wales on the northern beaches as you can see they've failed to control the erosion and it's all sand this is also the northern beaches of new south wales hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property this is how you don't do foundations in sand again northern New South Wales. But it isn't restricted. This is in England. This is the uh, the northeastern coast of England and it's falling into the North Sea and they can't stop it. This is in Massachusetts. Guess where they're going? It's going to happen. Don't they get too cocky. This is the Gold Coast. Look at those high rises. Billions of dollars will have to be spent to save billions of dollars worth of someone's freehold land. This is the Gold Coast in the 1950s. It's happened before because resistance is futile. So there we go, GI nerds. This is a truly beautiful part of Australia. 
a great place for fishing, crabbing, boating, kayaking, just hanging out on the beach. And yes, is there pumice stone in the passage? I doubt it. Around on the surf side, you'll almost certainly find a few pieces there. Thank you to Andrew, uh, dark man, for uh, um, asking me about this subject. And of course, you're, um, I'm sorry I couldn't attend your function up there, but maybe another time when the uh, stars line up. Anyway, Geo Nerds, that's your lot for this week. And remember, Geology, Geology rocks. rocks. Keep, Keep rocking. T-Rocks is, is out. out.